there a way out? Can I change my brain? Am I just a victim to who I am? I'm your host, Steve Sisler. Stay tuned for another episode of Behavioral Insights. Welcome, my children. <laughs> Today, part two of the need to be ourselves. I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you today. Stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in, my friends. I want to continue uh, on the same vein as we did last time talking about the image of self. Um, and I want to get a little bit deeper into uh, the nuances found in the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. It is definitely my all-time favorite children's book. Um, so a couple things. Number one, our image of self, it might be the most important element when it comes to our behavioral traits and our learning process when it comes to relating to people who are wired differently than we are. Now, what happens is two things. There are two gaps that can be created. Um, intrapersonal gaps and interpersonal gaps. So, uh, gaps are created between ourselves and other people when we fail to see others correctly. And these are interpersonal gaps. Um, gaps are also created when we fail to see ourselves in the right way. And these are known as intrapersonal gaps. So people with higher intrapersonal intelligence are aware of their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, but if you're not aware of your strengths and your weaknesses and you don't see yourself in the correct way, these intrapersonal conflicts lead to emotional stress. And that's something we all really want to avoid. So an intrapersonal gap materializes when there's a wide gap between where we currently are emotionally and behaviorally in the world and where we desire to be. So the size of this intrapersonal gap really becomes the size of the quandaries that they can create. So interpersonal gaps, what they represent is uh, the difficulties we experience between ourselves and others when our overextended emotions, which stem from our poor self images, begin to hijack our relationships. Now, we witness this in the example of the toy boat in the story of the Velveteen Rabbit, his living through two seasons in the nursery along with his semi-worn-out condition really fashions a gap between his, number one, his poor self-image, and then number two, what he fears the rabbit's perceptions might be of him. His poor self-image causes him to modify his behavior when interacting with the rabbit. This emotional gap really creates a problem. It causes the toy boat to misperceive his view of self. Think about uh, looking in a carnival mirror. The image of yourself is distorted and that's what happens. So because of this distortion, the toy boat must invent new approaches to how it really represents himself to others in the world in order to fill the growing gap between his authentic self and this misperceived self. This process is called behavioral modification. It's when our self-image is distorted and behavioral modification becomes our more or less unnecessary uh, attempt at fixing it. So this new and improved behavioral presentation 
uh, is fueled by the toy boat's inability to see uh, himself as worthy or meaningful uh, in his current condition. So instead, the toy boat tells himself rational lies. And this, you've heard me say this, this rationalizing is telling yourself rational lies. So he just rationalizes his behavior. Um, he rationalizes or he tells himself lies about his capacity for being a good toy. So rather than just being, he basically competes with the little rabbit in the story. Now, these lies about himself that the toy boat believes become self-evidentiary truths which enable the toy boat to never miss an opportunity to lay claim to his newfound image. And it's this newfound image is really brought on by the intrapersonal gap that's been created between himself and the new uh, toy rabbit. So the toy boat basically reinvents himself and believes the new invention is real, but it's not real. It's fake. Um, so the toy boat has a terrible self-image and its misrepresented behaviors are really the proof uh, of his distorted view of self. Now, one of the other toys, Timothy the Jointed Wooden Lion, he also gets in on the same act of dissimulation here. He uses uh, the process of association. He looks for an opportunity to associate with what he believes to be a more respectable party um, and then attempts to align himself with the character of his newfound associates, in this case, uh, the government. So uh, the lion replaces his own status with the status of the disabled soldiers who created him to avoid the shame uh, of being a plain old lion. So the, we see this in the world today with, with human beings. When people incorrectly sense that they have no real quality of their own, they might opt to identify with somebody else whom they think has a more acceptable or maybe a superior quality. And they do this through the process of personal identification. And it can look like name dropping, um, associating with certain people, referencing other people and their accomplishments. Um, think about people who love to take pictures of themselves on Facebook with important people. Um, this is uh, personification. Uh, it, it allows them to take on the merits of the more impressive people uh, and uh, it's actually a real act of insecurity. And <clears throat> in my opinion, it's a step in the wrong direction. This is really sad because it's, it's obvious when you see them on Facebook with uh, just finding celebrity types within their sphere uh, or genre or whatever. Um, uh, you know who they love to do this with, these entrepreneur types? Um, what's his name? The guy that owns Virgin Airlines. Um, you know, he has this island. I don't know why I can't recall his name. Gosh, see him all the time. But so many people, Richard Branson, so many people love to get their picture with Richard Branson. And in doing so, they're really trying to associate themselves with his wealth, um, with his success. Uh, and it's so obvious and it's really sad to me. Um, they got on this stupid grin and doing these selfies uh, as if to say, look at how successful I am. I'm palling around with Richard Branson. Um, and you wouldn't believe the people who do this. You wouldn't think they were insecure. But I'm telling you, that's exactly what it is. It's insecurity. Now, this irrational behavior is really prevalent not only in entrepreneurs' spaces, but in workplaces. Phrases such as, oh, I had lunch with so-and-so, or, you know, last night when I was meeting with the vice president of the company, <clears throat> you know, these are telltale signs of personal insecurity. People scheming and jockeying for position in an attempt to both look and feel important. Uh, 
perhaps somebody might arrange to have lunch with an individual they believe others believe is super important. Um, but either way, this irrational behavior spawned by wounded emotions um, work overtime in an attempt to appear better than these people believe they actually are. Rather than work being a place where you would enjoy the use of your gifts and your strengths and a shared existence with other people and their gifts and their strengths, work just becomes the self-esteem Olympics. People pulling strings and seeking personal relationships for the sole purpose of advancing their current position. Uh, because why? Well, they're grossly unsatisfied with who they really are. And this is what's so unfortunate. The more insecure we are, the more important we might be tempted to believe we are when we're with, quote, special people. So this is especially true when others are attempting to make us more important than we actually are for all the wrong reasons. In other words, there will be people who will want to associate with you because of their lack of self-worth and then you feel really good about you because they want to be with you. Um, and so for a lot of people, it's easier to make other people important and then associate with them than it is to feel secure in themselves and mind their own business. So this is known as social role awareness. So role awareness really represents our capacity for seeing and appreciating our place and function in our work. And it's about uh, that place and function giving us a sense of confidence and satisfaction in our role. Um, it also enables us to have a sense of contribution to the world. And it represents negative and positive feelings uh, of fulfillment um, in our current role. So feelings of importance and relevance can be either positive or negative. You either feel good about what you're doing or you don't feel good about what you're doing. You might feel like uh, you're not um, using your best skills in your work. You may feel like you're uh, not being recognized enough or maybe you feel like you're being overlooked or used or things like this. Um, in other words, a lot of what we feel, it's in strict relationship to other people um, and how we think they think we look and how what we think they think uh, we're feeling and things of that sort. Um, how many people in leadership uh, are leading for all the wrong reasons? Now, Healthy outcomes always hinge on whether or not you're a human being or a human doing uh, when offering any kind of service to an organization. Um, so unfortunately, uh, much of today's leadership roles are a poor attempt at being someone they don't believe they actually are. It's sort of like April Fool's Day, uh, you know, at work every day. Uh, for a lot of these people because they don't recognize uh, 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 themselves as being uh, important or viable uh, or worth anything in and of themselves. And this is why people have to associate and be affirmed by other people that they think are more important than they are. And you can probably, right now while I'm talking, you're probably thinking of somebody uh, who you know is a name dropper or who takes pictures with important people or always is telling you how they just talked to the boss or had a coffee with so-and-so and this type of a thing. Um, or maybe you are doing that. Now, you're going to have to really work at seeing it if it's true because your brain is not going to want to affirm that it's going to want to justify the way you feel. It's not going to want to verify if what I just said is true about you. So what I want you to do is stop the podcast right now, and I want you to think a minute. I want you to think about when you're working and when you're doing your role, whatever that is, 
and when it comes to your social life and your role awareness in your work, how healthy are you? How do you see yourself? How do you feel when you're with people that you might think are smarter than you, have a better role than you, or maybe are paid more than you, or other people fawn over them? Like, where are you in all this? Are you happy and healthy and content with who you are? And I want you to think about that uh, before we move on to this next section. Okay, I I hope you... um, participated in that little exercise. All right, let's talk about the self-affirmation system. So I'll begin with another quote from King Solomon. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider and not your own lips. Um, So although gaining self-importance is really a natural part of being human and really finding your place among tiered relationships, The self-affirmation system, it works between two points of reference. The first point of reference is uh, self-importance as an individual, and then the second one is self-importance as a group. So the idea of shared existence will always support uh, group self-importance, but it tends to reject individualism. So self-affirmation is primarily achieved through, through leadership. Uh, in the past, uh, and this is based upon the research of John G. Geyer, uh, leadership was defined by and associated with um, things like age, authority, influence, charisma, and personality. But after you know, continued investigation and behavioral analysis, researchers have concluded that the appointed leader does not necessarily perform in a leadership capacity as we formally understood it. So what the research is showing is that leadership shifts to that member of any group who has the capacity for coping with the task facing the group and the knowledge associated with the best outcomes that they need to reach. So really, coveted leadership is not appointed as much as it emerges. So emerging leaders uh, are far more respected and listened to by a group, uh, primarily because the group itself forces these leaders to the top. But self-appointed leaders don't experience half the respect emergent leaders do, according to Gaia's research. So this is very similar to the differences between functional and title authority. Now, we talked about that in, 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 I think it was the last podcast, we talked about functional and title authority. So some people have the function, some people have the title. So functional authority really is uh, something we would assign to emerging leaders and title authority, we would assign that to appointed leaders. Now, you may be appointed by someone else or you might appoint yourself. Either way, that type of a leader does not get the same respect as somebody who emerges from the group where other people are saying, oh, we need you know, Susan to be in charge of this group because she's incredible. Um, she's going to do a really good job. And everybody kind of agrees with that. And so Susan emerges from the group and by the group rather than you know, Carol appointing Susan, uh, whether you like it or not, um, or the group likes it or not. So true leadership is all about, really, it's all about taking responsibility at the expense of yourself in an effort to benefit the group. And a lot of these emerging leaders are the type of leaders that are serving other people, not expecting to be served by other people. Um, So many leaders uh, at the expense of the group make irresponsible decisions to benefit themselves. And this is akin to the wisdom of Solomon, who speaks of the human need to be seen as important and useful. Um, And I'm going to give you another Solomon quote here. It's better to wait for an invitation to the head of the table than to be sent away in public disgrace. 
um, I knew this person one time who uh, we were at a meeting and they just went and took the head seat. They went up to the head of the table and sat down and then somebody came in the room and asked them to move in front of everybody. It was awful. Uh, and so uh, you don't ever want that to happen. So this is actually has a name. It's called the power seat. So the power seat has to do with the power dynamics of where you sit um, at the proverbial table, you know, as a group. So something that happened to me a couple of years back, uh, I was invited to attend a conference in Waco, Texas by a friend who was one of the speakers there. So I decided to drive down and go. It was about a uh, two and a half, two hour drive down there. Um, and when I got there, I just, you know, entered the meeting, talked to a few people, whatnot. And I found myself a seat about halfway between the front and the back. Um, but right before the conference began, uh, this guy came over to my row and pointed to me and kind of gave me the finger, um, you know, the come here sign, you know, they, with their finger. Um, and I pointed to myself, like, and I mouthed the words me. And he said, yes. Um, now, this guy's in a black suit with the earpiece, you know. He's like, uh, I guess you could call him a, um, uh, I don't know what he was, but there was a couple of these guys around that were, had earpieces and making sure that I guess there was no trouble or something. Um, but he said, yeah, so I followed him and he walked up to the front and he pointed to a seat in the front row, right in the middle. Uh, and I looked at the seat and there was a sign on it that said reserved for Steven Sisler. So uh, that felt a little awkward because the place was, you know, a lot of people were already seated. Uh, but anyway, it, it was a pretty good feeling to be asked to come up and sit and that you know, somebody had an assigned seat for me up front. But this is an example of shifting. Uh, so everybody in charge, you know, had basically made a group decision to elevate my standing in light of their perception of who I was. I was affirmed by that group and I emerged by that group, which is much better than me going down front without being asked and taking a seat in the middle. Um, so I emerged from the center of the theater to the forefront by the behaviors and the drives of the other people, not my own drives, not my own behaviors, and not my own desires. And it was a great feeling. All right, um, let's talk about this. Let's talk about achieving versus receiving. So, uh, relationships and positions, and I've said this many times before, they shouldn't be achieved through subtle modifications and performance-oriented behaviors. Uh, in other words, jockeying for position is a good way to put that. They should be received through a process of automation by simply being yourself and just making informal contributions to the world in shared existence with the people around you. Relationships shouldn't be driven by our own unreasonable need-oriented efforts. They should be a simple result of who we are. They should just be an outflow of our authentic self in action. Now, in the story of the Velveteen Rabbit, um, the skin horse never instigates a knee-jerk reaction that causes the rabbit to labor for the relationship or for his special wisdom. Now remember, the skin horse is like the patriarchal figure of the nursery, um, the little boy's nursery, and he's overseeing all the toys. He's like, you know, uh, I don't know what you would call him, but he's like the Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, of the group. And so when engaging with the skin horse, the rabbit in the story, you could tell, is just, it's, he's really at ease. He's unchallenged by any insecurities within the skin horse or anything like that. Um, but the other toys, they create this sense of dis-ease, or it's really a disease, um, in everyone they meet, um, which is, again, the authentic sign of their low self-worth. They cause those around them to feel the need to perform you know, so they can keep up with them. So again, these insecure toys, remember uh, uh, Timothy, uh, the jointed wooden lion in the toy boat, um, you know, uh, 
uh, the toy. Yeah, so these insecure toys uh, make the rabbit jump through emotional hoops and then reward him with doubt and guilt for not jumping the right way. Um, they refer to their puffed up claims, which include, you know, in the boat's case, my exterior rigging, um, and then the toy soldier's mechanical prowess, and then the lion's government ties. Um, so the toys cause the rabbit to feel small uh, and really out of place. So their magnification of their own positions, their own contact, contacts, and their own government associations start to create intimidation that's, you know, in, in, the, in the little rabbit. Um, they create in him really an inferiority complex. Um, now, granted, he lets them, but it's their goal to do it. Uh, the other toys are now the ones responsible for the rabbit's performance, not the rabbit. And uh, the rabbit basically allows them to frame his world. So if the rabbit's going to fit within their relationship circle, he's going to have to achieve the same level of governmental or technical prowess that they claim to have. He's going to have to compete for a position on their team rather than just being on his own team and being happy with himself. So how many times has this happened to you? Whether you're joining a new job, a new church, a social club, or any other in-group, you know, we're all tempted to modify ourselves in order to fit into their world. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when I used to belong to the church, um, we would, you know, if we moved or what have you, we would sometimes, you know, we would go to a new church. And you would think out of all places, a church would be really easy to slip into because, you know, they're Christians. Um, it's all about the world and loving people, blah, blah, blah. But uh, in my experience, any time I ever was a part of a new church, I had to break in. Uh, I wasn't pulled in or brought in. I always had to break in to the existing framework and tribe. Um, and it's tough. It, and sometimes you just, you just don't want to bother. It's like, why do I have to work for this? Um, and oftentimes they had their own dress code, their language, you know, of course they have their own belief systems and you're required to mimic that if you're going to be successful, uh, in that group. Um, so this behavioral dynamic is everywhere today. And it's exhausting for most people to keep up with because we never seem to be able to get enough of it for some reason. People within certain set groups uh, may offer their services or advice on how to be like them. Uh, 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 you know, like, quote, this is how we like to do things around here, um, end quote. Uh, uh, and so, you know, whenever uh, you're a part of a group, um, Y y there are certain expectations, behavioral expectations around any tribe or any group. And if you don't meet them, you don't fit in. Now, it's sad, but I don't think there's a place where this doesn't happen. And the only way to make it work is for you to be super secure in yourself. And if you're not, it's a problem. And this reminds me of one of my all-time favorite movies, Hoosiers. Um, I don't know if you've seen Hoosiers, but uh, it was a movie from um, 1986, uh, and it's got uh, Gene Hackman in it, and he's a failed college coach. He actually punched some kid in the face and got fired from his college coaching job, and he gets a chance at redemption when he's hired by a friend to direct uh, a small basketball program at a high school uh, in a little Indiana town in uh, the 50s. Um, it's a great movie. Now, uh, Norman Dale is the Gene Hackman's character, Norman Dale. He's a core dominant, kind of a military style, gunnery sergeant type um, who, uh, you know, he's all about the game and all this kind of a thing. Um, and uh, he's given a second chance by his friend who's the principal of the school who's a passive um, type style. Oh, it's such a great movie, especially for me, behaviorally speaking. Um, 
So uh, there's a teacher, a female teacher there, played by Barbara Hershey. Um, and she persuades this one star player, this kid who's really good. His name in the, in the, uh, in the movie is Jimmy Chip, Chitwood. Um, uh, and she basically convinces him to quit and, and focus on his studies because he wasn't getting good grades because it was all about the basketball. So um, Gene Hackman or Norman Dale, he struggles to develop a winning team in the face of overwhelming in-grouping and excessive community criticism for his unconventional choice of assistant coach Shooter. That's his name, and he's played by Dennis Hopper. He's basically the town alcoholic, uh, but he's a basketball genius. And so I'm telling you, this makes me think of Trump like Trump coming to town and everybody freaking out um, because he's unconventional in almost everything he does. And uh, Gene Hackman in Hoosiers is unconventional. He's got the town drunk as his right-hand man because the town drunk knows a ton about basketball. Um, And so anyway, uh, when Norman Dale... um, Uh, gets to Indiana and he drives in and he starts working with the team. He walks into the gym uh, uh, in order to um, take over. And when he gets in there, there's another guy wearing a sweatsuit and a whistle around his neck. And it's, it's Chelsea Ross playing the part. Now, I don't know if you know who this guy is. Chelsea Ross, man, he is perfect for this job. His name's Coach George. And he's basically uh, just some guy in town, one of the dads. And he thinks he's all that because he's the coach. Oh, and he also plays the part of the replacement coach in the movie Rudy. Oh, (laughs) he plays the same kind of character in that movie as well. Uh, Chelsea Ross is super passive aggressive. And he's so he's threatened by Dill's natural leadership, which is very military like. Um, now, this is this is a lot like uh, the Velveteen Rabbit, this story, this movie, I mean. Um, so what's great is uh, anyway, when when Coach Norman Dale confronts Coach George, uh, he walks in and then, you know, coach George says to Norman Dale, he says, um, all right, here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, what we typically do is this, this, and this, and, uh, 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 you know, and we'll get him warmed up. Uh, you'll get the hang of it once you, you've been around here a little while. And then he blows his whistle and, uh, Norman Dale goes, uh, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, that's not verbatim, but in so many words, he's like, yeah, we're not doing that. And then he, he just he just says, uh, your coaching days are over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's so good. And then uh, Coach George basically throws the ball at him and walks out like a four-year-old because he just got usurped. Uh, but the reality is Norman Dale was hired by the principal to be the coach and the other guy who Chelsea Ross plays didn't want to give it up because it's all about the power and authority for him. Oh, my God. It, it's worth renting that movie just for that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the Velveteen Rabbit, the skin horse is so unlike Chelsea Ross, uh, his character in Hoosiers. Because uh, the skin horse reflects on the reality of what he is not and his durability as it relates to his authentic self. So, you know, the skin horse looks at himself in a, through a realistic lens when Coach George doesn't. Coach George believes he's a better coach than he is. He sucks. Uh, that's why they can't win anything. Um, and so uh, it's so good. Um, so the skin horse is vulnerable. He's approachable and safe. Uh, and he's okay with being a has-been. 
uh, the skin horse in the nursery and the velveteen rabbit, uh, he's okay where he is in the world. And Marjorie Williams, who wrote this story, she really teaches us that vulnerability is more valuable than gold. The, the skin horse remembers when he was the new toy on the block and how important it made him feel. But he has the wisdom and the maturity and the vision to know that those days are gone. This is what Coach George doesn't get. Uh, his coaching days have been over. He just didn't know it. Um, and so he can't give it up. It's just amazing. Uh, so because of the way the skin horse is thinking, he makes extra room for the rabbit without respect to himself because he understands that, you know, the rabbit's insecure and he himself is secure, talking about the skin horse. So he doesn't feel challenged. He doesn't feel threatened by the newness of the rabbit and the boy's love for him because it's his favorite Christmas toy. He's comfortable with who he is, not in light of the boy's affections, but in line with his own self-love, like the horse likes himself. So he's okay. He respects the boy's need for a new friend without taking offense. What is this? It's a sign of wisdom, security, and maturity. Oh my God, it's so good. So the, uh, the horse's vulnerable stability really attracts the rabbit like a velvet magnet. Uh, the skin horse's truthfulness, his ability to be real about who he is and who he is not. He has no pretense, no exaggerated claims. He's not talking about how cool he is and how he's the patriarch. None of that. And he makes the rabbit feel safe and secure in himself. So this is usually the result when associating with secure people. They make you feel comfortable. They make you feel valuable instead of, be, instead of feeling worthless, uncomfortable, and stupid, um, which is what Coach George tried to do to Norman Dale in Hoosiers. So I want to uh, quote you one of my favorite conversations uh, in The Velveteen Rabbit, and this is between uh, the rabbit and the skin horse. Here's how it goes. What is real? asked the rabbit one day while they were lying by the side near the nursery fender before Nana came in to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time. Not just to play with, but really loves you. Then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. I suppose you are real, said the rabbit, and then he wished he had not said it, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. Oh my God. That woman, Marjorie Williams, who wrote these lines, she's a genius. That's all I got to say. She is a freaking genius. It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time, and it's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easy. 
people with sharp edges, and people who have to be carefully kept, like Coach George. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you're real, you can't be ugly. You're only ugly to people who don't get it. My God, it's genius. The skin horse and all his wisdom breaks this relationship down to its simplest form, like a fraction becoming simplified. He subtracts all the unnecessary elements from the equation and presents the Velveteen Rabbit with his answer. To be real is to be loved for who you are. When we project pretend images to people around us, we end up with pretend relationships, pretend friendships, pretend marriages. We end up with pretend religion. Oh my God. God, love and faithfulness, they become fictitious like movies or fairy tales reserved for the bedside. We spend the rest of our lives trying to hold on to uh, make-believe relationships we've created through a process of continued scheming and relentless pretending in hopes of establishing a reality we don't believe is even possible. This is the process of the achiever. Achievement is only warranted when the motives are in alignment with a healthy goal. Otherwise, it becomes a need-oriented goal fueled by exaggerated and unreasonable accomplishments. This causes relationships to become instrumental in meeting our personal needs rather than meeting the needs of those around us. It becomes an unhealthy, most lonely pit of self-interest at the expense of everybody around you, fueled by your own low self-esteem. My God, I wish people could change this. Now, some have, and maybe you're one of those, and if you are, I applaud your effort. It's so good to love yourself and to be content with who you are and with who you are not. <sighs> wow. I'm glad I got that off my chest. That's why I wanted to do a part two. I don't know if I'm going to do a part three. I might. We'll see. And I thank you for being with me. I thank you for spending the time and listening to this. Um, I hope it does your heart good. It just did mine. I just feel like I took a bath just talking about this. <laughs> well, you know who I am. I'm Steve Sisler. And you've been listening to Behavioral Insights. <laughs>